We should be live. Welcome, everyone. I think this will be really a super special um, episode of this uh, Talking with Sirius. A series we started with just uh, talking with one of my friends, Odilian Tuarog. And now, look at this. I have uh, uh, maybe one of, uh, of the greatest people of the, on the tech uh, community. And uh, we'll talk about uh, learning online from the learner point of view and also by the content creator point of view. But let me introduce uh, all my guests one by one. I have some notes, sorry for that. I had not time to prepare something. So uh, we have uh, Angie Jones, uh, Senior uh, Director specialized in test automation, DevRel at Apple Tools, uh, international keynote speaker, Java champion. Uh, welcome, Angie, in this, uh, in this show. Also, we have Alice Pittel. She's a JavaScript and Python engineer, and also a teacher, of course, uh, uh, a super great blogger, public speaker. Uh, he, she leads uh, developer advocacy at uh, AWS Amplify. Amplify. And also, I like that, she is a co-host on the Ladybug podcast. I really like that show. And now you see also someone who has been already on my channel two weeks ago, Colby. <laughs> the welcome again. He is a software engineer, DevRel, and AstroCoder. I want to make a question about that. <laughs> uh, Topfly Tools, too. And also, I like uh, his show, uh, Kolba Yashimaru on Twitch. One day, probably, I'll be his guest. Uh, let's see, let's see. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Quincy Larson. He is a teacher and founder at a company that I really can't remember now the name. Oh, yes, Freecode Camp. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. Uh, let's see, let me write. Uh, hello. OK, so. Sorry for this super fast introduction, but if you want to make uh, introduce yourself uh, one by one, uh, uh, that would be great. Angie, can we start with you? Sure. So I, I'm going to stick to the points that's pertinent to the discussion today. Um, I am the creator of Test Automation University, which is an online platform with free courses on all things testing software. Um, I think I just said all the courses are free. If I didn't, uh, let me <laughs> say that again. So all the courses are freely available um, and are self-guided. Um, so you take them at your own pace. I also um, was an adjunct professor for many years uh, teaching Java at the collegiate level. Um, so have some experience in teaching both in person as well as online. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Angie, for your introduction. Hallie, can you introduce yourself? I've seen your last uh, speech about uh, blogging. I really liked that one. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. I, I'm going to keep giving that one because it's one of my favorites to do. Um, I'm Ali. I lead and manage developer advocacy at AWS Amplify, which is a really cool job. I get to teach as part of that, but mostly online doing asynchronous things like uh, blog posts and YouTube videos and things like that. But before that, I was actually an in-classroom teacher. So I was the faculty lead at General Assembly. So I was teaching in-person classrooms for a coding boot camp. And I actually studied education in school too. So I went through like the middle school classrooms, shadow semester and all those types of fun things. So that's a little bit about my background and I can advocate for both in-person and online. Uh, learning in this platform perfect so this will be great also so you can we can explain maybe the difference also from your point of view and because uh, this really interested me yeah thank okay. you colby i love your background i really love thank that. you thank I, you i'm gonna copy you in some ways but i, I have a lot of work to do <laughs> i appreciate it still you know it's on you're on your way there but yeah so i've been a developer advocate since december working alongside uh, angie at apple tools um I'm a lifelong learner and I've also been writing and teaching courses and making tutorials on YouTube, trying to do what I can. I don't have the in-person teaching credentials like the fine folks here, but um, I've been doing a lot of educational content on online and you know, keep pushing hard on that. 
Perfect. And uh, let me just say that you have uh, the Kolbayashi Maru uh, episode today. Is I do, right? I do. At 3.30 okay, so, p.m. Eastern. Okay, so we are going to promote you also on the end of the stream. Please remember that if I forgot about, about that. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Quincy, uh, this camera this time is really great. The other time when you've been on my channel, it was not the best in the world, but uh, I really like. And also the the what you have in your t-shirt is is almost perfect. It's it's in the perfect level. <laughs> Thank you. That. <laughs> yeah, Quincy. Yeah, can you please introduce yourself just sure. for maybe someone out there doesn't know you? Maybe can, yeah. let's fix that. Well, th thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, so I worked as a like a classroom teacher and as a school director for about 10 years before at age 30, 31, like sitting down and learning some basic Python, learning some basic JavaScript, and ultimately transitioning into software engineering role at a company and all that. So uh, teaching is very near and dear to my heart. And uh, I consider myself first and foremost a teacher, even though mostly I'm teaching through other people by like coaching them on topics that they should write about or helping edit their articles uh, or giving them feedback on, you know, uh, the delivery of like one of their talks. So uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a teacher. Um, a lot of what I do is in the background. Like you won't generally see me in a lot of like videos uh, or articles uh, these days because I'm trying to, you know, teach through other people if that makes sense. But uh, I, I follow all, I, like I read the, the Chronicle of Higher Education and like inside uh, higher ed and like all these different blogs and newspapers and stuff. And I, I do my best to try to stay on, on top of like adult education specifically. I don't know as much about, uh, you know, early childhood or K through 12, but uh, adult education, I consider myself to be, you know, uh, some a work in progress as far as understanding how it all works. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. And I, I'm thrilled that, Education is the topic, and, and learning yeah. is the topic of this talk. Yeah, and just let me let me say that all this show, uh, to be honest, it's a is a Quincy idea. So he, when I had the call Colby on my my show, he said like, oh, "Why, Francesco? Why don't you do a multiple guest interview?" And here we are. So just give me an idea, and then make this in, in, pra in practice. So this has been really uh, an amazing idea. Just a little bit of background about myself. I want just to say just one thing that uh, both of my parents are teacher, so teachers. So I really like this idea of teaching. I maybe I have some teaching DNA yeah, in my veins. So this is really a great topic for me. I think this is really, maybe it's kind of a mission maybe to teach to someone. Some, uh, this could be applied to any topic, not just uh, computer science, of course. Okay, perfect. So. I think we're ready. Just let me check if we have some uh, some questions already. It seems like not uh, yet. So if you want to drop this, uh, your com questions in the comments, this is a this fancy slideshow. So I think that you can start from what's for all of you the concept, concept of learning online? Because I think this is a very generic question. So maybe everybody, every one of you has a different idea of what is. It's just uh, don't even open a book, just learn everything on YouTube or something else. So who wanna start? I can start. I, I, I look at it as two different ways. One is, yes, consuming information that's delivered online, right? So online courses, whether that be video, text, whatever, um, it's not the traditional classroom, it's not the traditional textbook, but you're using these online mediums to educate yourself or um, engage with teachers online. The other way I look at it is kind of um, publicly learning, if you will. So maybe you are doing you know a, a traditional course or um reading a book or in a boot camp or something like that but you are showing what you're learning online to you know the public uh audience if you will so that could be in the form of tweet threads or um blog posts or something like that where you know hey, I'm going to learn about Flutter and I'm going to take you on this journey with me kind of thing. 
Perfect, perfect. Thank you, thank you, Angie. Yeah, someone else would like to start uh, to say something about this? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that was a great introduction to it. I also want to shout out that there are two forms of online art learning. The first is asynchronous. So things like online courses, maybe through a Udemy or Test Automation U or reading somebody's blog post or watching their YouTube videos. But there is also synchronous content online that you can also take courses in. So that would be like a live coding boot camp or a live university course or something along those lines. And the there is a big difference there, right? So there are some huge benefits to asynchronous learning that anybody can participate. It scales much better because the instructor doesn't have to be there live to a classroom teaching everybody at once. It can reach a ton more people. And so there are huge benefits to that, but there are also huge benefits to this synchronous learning in that you have a cohort that you're moving with and other students that you can work with. You have a teacher you can ask live questions to and asynchronous learning has some of this integrated as well. Well, maybe they'll have TAs or something along those lines who can answer your questions. But one of the huge benefits of that synchronous learning is you can stop the instructor right there. Like explain that again. I don't understand it. Um, and so I think it's just important to shout that out that there are multiple formats and uh, they scale in different ways. And I think also it's important to note this intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation with learning. And if you're intrinsically motivated, like you're very self-motivated, I think learning through asynchronous content works really well because you can create your own study plans or you can use something like free code camp and follow that guided curriculum and stay with it. But some people deal better when they have some sort of extrinsic motivation, like an instructor being like, yeah, you got to do your homework. <laughs> you got to get this done. And so different people learn differently and how are going to have different motivations. Yeah, I really like this idea. To be honest, I think uh, I am a fan of synchronous online because maybe so I don't have to edit. So I like, for example, do some, some live stream so people can come join. I know that there are two different things. So different to have a course or have something like uh, people can just jump on your chat. So in that case, it's really like maybe a great experience for who is there, maybe a little bit, little bit less for who comes after the live stream, of course. And, uh, for example, uh, we have here Colby, who does these uh, really great uh, challenges. Let's go uh, like that. Uh, I've seen one some weeks uh, weeks ago. With uh, I can remember just the Twitter handle, the worst dev. I remember that. Right. <laughs> I watched the, that all. It was very very fun. So Colby, what's your what's your idea of uh, of teaching and learning online for people on your show and also YouTube, but also your YouTube channel? Yeah. Yeah, so I think everything that's been said so far has, has been really interesting. I've actually never heard it uh, called synchronous versus asynchronous before, and I really I like it. that kind of, I, I like it. that description of it. It works really well, especially like programming, right? Because those are the words that we're, we know <laughs> near and dear. Exactly. I think there's also an interesting kind of thing uh, to what Angie was saying about learning in public, because there's almost like these micro interact, micro learning interactions that people get by posting like tweets and stuff where maybe they're replying to a Twitter thread or something where they're learning something as they're having that conversation with people. And I don't, I don't know what the name for that would be, but I think that's also an interesting kind of part of the entire online learning and experience. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Colby. Quincy, would you like to add something? Yeah, yeah. Well, what uh, what Ali was saying a minute ago about like synchronous versus asynchronous, and asynchronous is great for people who have a high degree of intrinsic motivation uh, and don't need like I guess the positive peer pressure of like a cohort or a classroom of people. And uh, there are a lot of really great tools, and and uh, I think there there's a lot of room for improvement in that area as well. I describe most traditional schooling as that, and uh, Free Code Camp is, is more of an experiment with like, like, hey, if we just give people the resources and let them figure out, you know, when and how to to learn these things. So I would say we we represent like the very extreme edge of like asynchronous and like intrinsically motivated. Like there are people in cities that like. Don't like they don't have computers necessarily. They're they're learning on a smartphone. Uh, 
Mm. A lot of people uh, who live off, you know, a fact of life is that about uh, half of the people on earth live off less than $5.50 a day. Um, and those people are still able to learn to code. They just have to figure out how to do it on their phones or if they can get access to like a library computer or, uh, you know, like an inexpensive laptop, then they can learn. And we want to make sure that there are good free learning resources for them. Uh, so we, we've definitely focused on, <laughs> on creating free learning resources. In fact, Free Code Camp's mission is creating free learning resources. It's not necessarily helping people successfully go out and get developer jobs, although that's a positive side effect from it. Um, a lot of people will use Free Code Camp in conjunction with like a university degree or with uh, you know some sort of uh, club. Uh, a lot of people join like a hacker space or some other kind of uh, organization and learn that way. But I think what what Ali what Ali was talking about there is just like that's that really is those are two of the big continuums the poles that are really important in education right now and I think a lot of the future discussion around educational solutions is going to be you know talking about those two things. Yeah, and I think, I think if people we'll, okay go 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 go. go. I was just gonna say, I think one thing that's cool about both like Free Code Camp and Test Automation University is you you are just kind of giving those resources, but and you're not pro providing that like pressure to learn. But what ends up happening, like I've seen happening, is there's the communities that grow around that, and they, like you said, they go in those little cohorts and keep themselves in kind of uh, check for learning through those things, helping each other out and providing that other factor to help them through that course. Yeah, I just wanted to add just one thing that uh, I think that people really like this uh, um, YouTube channel, let's say, a very big YouTube channel for your camp, because the last time when I uh, invited the Quincy Queen Larson on my YouTube channel, it had, uh, it had like uh, two million and a half subscribers. And now I think it's close to five million, something like that, uh, free code camp. So yeah, so it's growing super, super fast. Uh, yeah, best luck with that, because you're doing a really an amazing job. Uh, and there are some also I like I liked also the the story of Rigot Camp. So this has been really really great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's yeah. It's a big community effort. Um, yeah. And it wouldn't be nearly if it was just me like recording videos. Like you know, I spent the first two years of building Free Code Camp like live streaming on Twitch. If it was still me, it would still be really small. But uh, we've got like a lot of very talented. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying maybe to collaborate on the Italian translation. So uh, yeah, I need to check also be set up, but uh, of course, I can give a hand probably in that case. So I have this question for Sanjita. I don't know if I pronounced that well. Uh, typically, how long every day do you set aside for learning for career? So maybe uh, they are asking for. How if you also uh, the past the time that you use you pass for learning so this is like a question for some of you would you like to answer to this some of you how much time yeah I um I like this question because um a lot of times people will say they don't have time to learn right um oh they don't give me time at work for this and that sort of thing. Um, I really strongly believe that we have to take initiative and own the fact that this is our career, right? Um, and set that time up, right? I don't know many leaders who, you know, would discourage you from learning something that is going to be that's going to help you be better at the job that they're paying you for, right? Um, if you're learning how to, I don't know, build shelves or something and they're paying you to be an engineer, then yeah, of course they might have a problem with that. But I set aside at least 30 minutes to an hour every day to learn something. And that might not be tinkering with code. It could be reading various blog posts or something while I have my morning coffee or it could be building something or, oh, they just released this new feature in Java. I want to try it out. So I'll set aside. Now, I will acknowledge that with the role that I have as a developer advocate, I kind of have certain privileges that 
um, a lot of other engineers may not have because of time constraints and things like that. But um, before I became, that's how I became one, right? So before I became one, I was just kind of doing this stuff either on my lunch break or after work or, you know, before work or something like that. I realized like everyone is super busy, um, but we can't put that burden on someone else to give us permission to advance ourselves. So definitely try to find a way to sneak some time um, to advance your knowledge because this, this tech space is ever changing. Yeah, I totally agree with this. I think that for our job, our career, we have to stay updated at, at every level. We need to take time. Sometimes I joke about this, uh, that uh, the perfect excuse is that is that I have no time to make things like uh, I have no time to create groups, uh, or I have no time to tweet and something like that. But also, yeah, so it's very important. If we make this uh, like a priority, which I think is really important uh, for us developers uh, at each level, you can be a beginner, you can be considered as an expert, but you really need to stay updated because uh, it's uh, really an evolving, it's it's a living technology. Every language, every framework is a living technology. You need to stay updated, even if that's your niche, even if you are considered like the expert, maybe in that case, you need to stay updated even more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a couple of thoughts on this. So first off, that it's going to look dramatically different at different points in your career. Like early on in my career, I would spend like, all night, almost every night, learning new things and doing those Udemy courses or doing those online resources in order to learn new things and strengthen my skills or, you know, do practice interview problems on leak code or whatever. And now later on in my career where I've been in a leadership position, I think of it more as a needing on as or learning on an as needed basis. So if I need to learn something for work, that's when I prioritize it. Um, I do still enjoy learning things and find it very fun, but there are other things that I need to focus on more. And so learning the things that I need to learn versus learning things just for the fun of it is something that I've, I've prioritized a little bit more, at least in the last couple of years. Uh, I also think, though, making a habit of learning is so important. So something that I do is every single day I read a chapter of a technical book that only takes like, you know, 15 minutes or so, but it gives me some sort of new skill set and I take notes on it because taking notes will make it stick much harder in your brain. Um, in addition to that, I spend like 15 minutes writing a day and that makes it so that I have this habit of sharing out to the public because one of the best ways to learn something is to, by teaching it to somebody else. It solidifies that knowledge in your mind. And so these are some of the things that I do. Like a lot of my job is learning something in order to teach it to somebody else. And so I definitely prioritize that, but I am not necessarily at this point in my career where I'm like, oh, I don't know go that well. I'm going to go learn it just for the heck of it. Instead, it's more like, what are the skills that I need to progress my career at my day job? How can I learn those things? And then how can I share those things with the public? And that's definitely progressed over the course of my career. Like a couple of years ago, I would have learned Go just for the heck of learning Go, but not necessarily yeah. so much now. Yeah, uh, let's say me too. So if you want to to give it another try, we can try that because uh, I also had this idea to, okay, let's let's learn this JavaScript framework. Now let's learn Go. Uh, yeah, it was exactly that. I think that I have a Udemy course. I made like uh, 10 lessons and that's it. So I never, I never ended that because maybe you need, as you say, the, like an idea of your progresses, maybe also yeah, your, the projects that you want to build. So now I'm more focused on what I want to build and also teach now. And then uh, I, I learn, of course, a little bit every day. I, have, I am a former coach. I've been a volleyball coach for 20 years. So I like this idea of uh, uh, staying like uh, trained to exercise every day. I work every day in the morning to get some good ideas like this series, for example. So I like this idea of uh, a little bit uh, every day. Yeah. 
call me the yeah. US something to say, yeah. Yeah, Google. and I Sorry. think it's funny because I'm kind of, you know, I was similar to Ali when I was kind of learning where I remember going through all my different like RSS feeds. <laughs> People used to use RSS feeds and email newsletters. And I had like a huge bookmark site where I had all these different articles that <laughs> I had to read, you know, the very specific things of JavaScript and all these new technologies. And I, you know, now I'm, similar to Ali, where like I like to learn things as I'm doing it. Like I kind of go by the learning by doing thing. Cause I think as you are learning by doing something, you're also having like real world experience with learning that particular uh, concept. And it's also helping instill it in your brain as you are applying it to a real world situation. Um, but it, you know, as much as it was fun having all those articles in my backlog, like I wish back then I would have had that kind of mindset where I would learn it as I was trying to put something into practice a little bit more than spending the times going through the tutorials. Cause ultimately I feel like all that time spent, it was fun learning those things, but I didn't retain it because I was just kind of going through all those articles, like article by article. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see this question. Quincy, if you want to add something or otherwise we go, we go, let me go on on this one. Uh, Zwag Emanuel says, uh, when stuck on a problem, when do you ask for help? And this is a good, good question. One hour into working on the solution. So maybe he says like, uh, how much time it has to pass since you are ready to ask for questions? Yeah, um, I, so I have, uh, I guess, uh, I've thought a lot about this <laughs> because it comes up all the time in the pre -code camp community. And uh, when I was learning, I was uh, always, wary of like disturbing my more experienced peers and distracting them from doing their work uh, just to help me get unstuck with whatever I was working on, which is usually something less important because <laughs> the mission critical stuff was being done by the more experienced developers uh, usually. So um, I there's a professor at Berkeley uh, in the uh, computer science and electrical engineering program, and I heard him give a talk at uh, UC Santa Barbara, and he had this big MOOC. And uh, it was, uh, but he, he called it RASP. Read, uh, ask, search, post, uh, RASP. And uh, so nice. first of all, I thought like, well, that's good. But first of all, like RASP is not like a very good sounding word, like raspy voice. Second, uh, posting on like Stack Overflow. I mean, like that's like, okay, I've been stuck on this bug for like days. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, let's let's do the Hail Mary like post on Stack Overflow. I don't know, maybe you can get a response faster than that. But I, I thought let's let's simplify this. And I so I created what's called read, search, ask. Because I resequence it because I, I feel like you really just need to spend time, make sure you read the uh, error message, make sure you read the documentation, then start searching. Because if you just start firing off searches uh, before you've really understood the problem, you're just spinning your wheels, right? Um, but if you search and you really can't find anything, if your problem is truly novel or you just can't figure out how to articulate a search, that's when you move to the ask portion. And that's when you impose upon someone else to take time to like answer your question. So up until that point, the last step, you haven't inconvenienced anybody. So uh, it, it totally comes down to your question, uh, Swag Emmanuel. Like it comes down to, in my mind, um, have you, it could be like five minutes that you spend like reading the documentation and searching and you just come up empty. So that's when you ask. Um, and asking, of course, could be like going on the Discord of the specific technology and asking or posting on Stack Overflow or posting on a forum somewhere. Free Code Camp, we have like an ask button. You can just press it and it'll like take your existing code and format it into a forum post. And then usually you get a response within, you know, a few hours there. Um, but yeah, uh, there's no right answer. There's no one right answer, but I recommend using that sequence. Read, search, ask. Yeah, I really like that. Um, I don't think that it's a good idea to like set a timer and say, all right, after one hour, if I don't have the answer, then I get to go ask someone for help, right? Um, it could take longer than an hour. It could take shorter. I agree with what Quincy said. You do your due diligence, right? So try to figure out like, what is, what is even happening here? Okay. Um, why am I stuck? What don't I know? Basically be able to identify what don't you know, you know, at least try to do that part. Um, and then 
again, yep, search for a, a solution. A lot of times I find people will ask me a question and I literally just paste what they asked me into Google. <laughs> and I'm like, here's your solution right here, the top answer. Like, so it kind of shows me like you didn't even try to search for it, which um, is a bit frustrating. So try to do a search. And then if you come to someone with a very pointed question, here's where I'm stuck. I tried this, that didn't work, and I don't know what to do next. Then people are much more willing to help you out because it doesn't feel you know, like a lazy question or you're trying to get me to do your work for you or something like that. You genuinely are stuck. And people usually don't mind helping you get unstuck kind of like the stack overflow formula right if you just ask a blanket question on stack overflow without any context or without um having mentioned what you've tried already people are usually pretty hostile i'm not promoting hostility um but you know that same kind of frustration is what people feel they might just not express it so do your due diligence show them what you've tried um because then that also eliminates them giving you those solutions or trying those solutions because they know you've tried it already and you can get to the, the heart of it. Yeah, I can give a plus one to what Angie just said that you should definitely show what you have tried already because that will make it so that people are more willing to help you. But I think of it as the productive struggle versus the unproductive struggle. So usually when you're starting to struggle with something, you can still be searching different things and you can still be trying different things. But at some point you get so frustrated by it that A, you should walk away for a little bit. But B, if you're getting frustrated by it or really confused or maybe even moving further away from getting the answer, that's at the point where you should ask for help. Um, but I think it's so important to try things first because this is something that I see with new developers all the time. Their first instinct will be to ask an instructor or something along those lines. But one of the most important skills that you can have as a developer is to be able to find these answers yourself. And you won't You'll have senior devs at work most likely, but at the same point, you want to, won't want to ask them very basic questions. And so make sure that you're building up those research skills, that you're looking into how to make maybe advanced Google searches. Like you can search, you can specify on Google that you only want to search after a certain date, for example. Um, so only posts after 2017 so that you're only getting modern Python, for example. Uh, doing that type of work up front is the most important thing that you can do. So try to do as much of that as possible before you ask for help. But when it's, it starts being unproductive, that's when you should start asking, in my opinion. Perfect. Thank you, Ali. Yeah. Kobe, would you like to add something? About yeah. This? And then just like after like you get to that point where you are stuck, I found one thing that's helped me in the past and something that I've helped with some of my, uh, my direct reports in the past is even if you do get stuck and you're to a point where you do want to ask somebody on your team for help, instead of just trying to get their attention right away and take them out of their, their, their personal flow that they're in, try to see if you can schedule like 30 minutes in the future and hop on a stream and try to maybe pair program and try to work through that problem. Cause then you can actually, instead of them just giving you the answer, you could see how they got to that answer and see how they search for something or then you can learn from it rather than just getting the answer and walking away. Yeah, I think it's like a, if you're stuck and just read the solution of a math problem, you don't really get uh, W w which was uh, the problem yeah you just get the solution you copy that uh, and that's it so in the case is not really helping you and uh, yeah since we are basically also problem solvers we need to learn to google yeah <laughs> before and after we need to learn that so the earlier the better that's my that's my opinion yeah quincy would you like to add something or you, you know you had already answered to this yeah you were the first one yeah yeah we have other questions I don't know if we can cover them all, but uh, let's let's try. Let's try to be fast. How do you retain new stuff that you are learning? Who would like to start on this? Ellie, would you like to have some idea? Cool. I can chime in here. So the first thing is taking notes and in your own words instead of 
just copying and pasting from there because summarizing and synthesizing that information is really important. Something that I do with students that I think can actually help really a lot when you're independently learning too is focusing on a I do, we do, you all do, you do format. So that is when you first explain something so that for you learning on your own, that could be reading an article about something, watching a YouTube video, something along those lines. And maybe you do multiple different formats of that because the research has stated that the idea of learning styles isn't super valid, that instead people learn best when they learn the same material using different formats. So read a blog post, watch a video on it. And then the we do would be coding along with them. So if you're watching a coding tutorial, type out the code with them. Don't just copy and paste it again, type it out. And then the last part is make it stick by actually completing some sort of project with it. So create a widget or create a full application or something like that to apply what you've learned because if you're just watching tutorial after tutorial after tutorial, you're not actually coding. And coding is the thing that you need to do in order to learn how to code better. And so that's the most important part of this is breaking out of that cycle of tutorials and actually creating something at the end. So that's what I would say is take notes, vary your learning styles and build things. That build things part mm -hmm. is really um, crucial for me. Um, you know, I used to take tutorials because I just like to learn stuff and have, you know, new new skills in my tool belt or whatever. And I found when I would learn it, I could follow along, I could code along, I could answer the quizzes. But in a year, I don't really know that anymore. <laughs> um, if you ask me anything, it's kind of just gone, right? Um, so the way I approach it now is, um, very much so like what Allie said in the beginning where she's not just learning things to learn them anymore. Like I'll have some basic knowledge. Like I know React 18, did it come out yesterday or something? It's coming out or yeah, what? The alpha came yeah. out yesterday. Okay, Alpha came out. So like yeah. stuff like that. And I might go today and read like what's going to be in React 18 or something like that. So that kind of stuff is like very, very surface level. Um, the only way I would dive into, oh, let me try out React 18 or whatever is if I had a project I want to build. So I go into these things, into the tutorial already with something that I want to build. And I'm basically like, show me the, the way and then I'm going to apply it. So every lesson, I'm thinking about my project, very selfish, right? I'm thinking about my project and how this will be applicable to me, right? So for example, I want to learn Flutter. I'm not just gonna go in and like, oh, I wanna learn Flutter. Like sure, I can pick it up and I might be able to build a toy app along with the instructor or something like that. But I have a very specific app in mind that I want to build. And I believe that's going to help cement this very much so because um, I'm taking what they're giving me and then I'm applying it to a totally different space and problem, right? Some of the things are gonna be missing in that tutorial because of the app that I chose. So that forces me to kind of dig deeper and seek other resources as well to complement what I'm learning. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. I like that. And I, I would just add, like, I 100% agree with what Angie's saying. And I think that uh, having some sort of like, project in mind that is maybe tangentially related to what you're learning that you can turn around and like, okay, I just learned this, but how can I apply it to this? That forces your brain to really struggle, grapple with the, uh, the concepts that you just learned and, and turn around and apply them. I think another yeah. interesting thing to what Ali was saying earlier about, instead of just taking notes word for word, what you see on the screen or something, I actually kind of apply that to code. So if I need to copy a code snippet, cause I don't know how something will work, I might, paste it in right away to see if it works. But because I'm so picky about what my code looks like, I actually deconstruct it and figure out what each of those steps are doing. So I have a better fundamental understanding of what that code's doing, which in turn helps me learn what each of those different concepts are. 
Yeah, uh, just I didn't, you know, did just uh, one thing. I had uh, Kevin Powell on uh, my YouTube channel, interviewed him, and we talked about uh, uh, that uh, YouTube tutorials uh, about coding, they are not like Netflix series. Of course, you can watch them, like sitting on a coach, uh, watching them, but you don't get uh, a great benefit out of that, of course. In that case, probably it's better to see a different uh, series and something maybe, I don't know, maybe more related to <laughs> something else. Perfect. Thank you. Let's see. Let's see another question. Oh, I like this one. Uh, this is a question, of course. How do you determine the best resource to learn a certain skill? Certain skill. This is a very hard question, I think. I would like to start. I can jump in. Oh, like, no, instead of worrying about like the best resource, you can spend a lot of time trying to figure out, oh, is this teacher really the best person to teach this topic? I find it's helpful to just err on the side of bulk and like watching like several teachers talk about a different concept. Uh, you have these resources now. You can go to YouTube and just watch, you know, Kevin Powell explain something and, uh, you know, with, uh, with CSS, for example, and then uh, you could go and, and you could watch uh, some of the other creators uh, explain the same concept or similar concepts. And so you're going to kind of like the, the main thing that I, I would encourage people to think of when you're learning, don't think of it as like, I can't recall this very specific thing. Therefore, I must not have learned it. Like every time you get exposed to a concept or you, you're spending time writing code or reading code and like typing that yourself or typing similar code, like that just etches the pathways a little bit deeper into your brain. And you may feel like you're, you've completely plateaued, but you're, you're probably still making quite a bit of progress. Uh, so it's not a matter of like looking for the best thing. It's just a matter of like saying, hey, this is good. It, a lot of people get hung up on like, well, what's the best band ever <laughs> or something like that? Well, there are like hundreds of really, really good bands, right? So you don't have to just listen to one band. You can listen to a lot of bands. And it's the same thing with like teachers and, and with really anything. Uh, life is long. A day is a, as the saying goes, I can't remember who said this, but a day is a coat with many pockets and you can put many things into it, uh, depending on how you want to divide up your time. Perfect, Quincy. I think I'm going to steal one or two things that you said. One of the two your analogies are going to steal them, them. And of course, I'll credit you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I usually... Um... If there's an expert that I know of, I'll try to, um, you know, gravitate towards their content. If not, sometimes I just Google, right? And I find whichever one I, I'm vibing with the best. So I'll start like at the top. I'll try that one. It's like, all right, this person is speaking way over my head. Like I'm not at that level. So move on to the next one. The second search result is like, Okay, this one's a little bit better, but I'm still like very confused here. <laughs> you go to the third one and that person is just speaking very plainly, you know, and I'm like, okay, I, I can follow this person. Um, and it might not be someone I know or anything like that. That's okay. So I think just like what Quincy said, like there's a lot of stuff out there. Kind of find which one is speaking to you. Um, and that's why I always encourage people to put out content, even though it might already exist from someone else. Um, the way that people consume information or the level they need it at varies. So having multiple options out there only helps um, the community. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Angie. I found a very interesting question. Um, Chloe, hi there. How do you stop yourself getting overwhelmed with information and make sure, sure you are learning what is important? I think this is a very great question. Would you like to start, some of you? We have some volunteers. This is such a great question. Um, I feel this way sometimes myself, even with like a lot of experience in the industry. Um, for example, when I when I needed to do like some front end work and I was like, oh, I need to pick up one of these front end frameworks. It was like I was paralyzed by all of the options out there. You don't know like 
where to start. You don't know which tools work better with the others. It was just very, very alarming. And I was thinking, my goodness, if I feel like this, you know, what do others feel like who are brand new to the industry? And it's just like this wealth of um, information, like tools and programming languages and all of this stuff is very, very difficult um, to figure that out. I had to just pick something. I don't care if it's like dated. I don't care if this is not what the cool kids are talking about. For example, I'm gonna pick on React 18 again. That has come out. Um, I haven't looked into it, so y'all don't drag me, but some of the tweets I was saying, it's like, oh, this feels like PHP, right? So it's funny because everybody was kind of like, oh, PHP is old and dead. And then like, as this stuff starts um, progressing, you see it becomes more of the same. So my advice is again, just pick something and start building. You start realizing very quickly once you start building what else you need, right? Oh, I need to store or persist this information uh, you know, for multiple users. I think I need to learn databases now, right? And so then, you know, you start figuring out what's the next step when you come up with the project. Otherwise, you're just kind of lost in in trying to figure out like, all right, I know I learned JavaScript, what else am I supposed to learn now, right? If you think about it in terms of like a real project, um, it starts to become much clearer what you need. Yeah, yeah. I really like this approach. Sorry, Ali. I really like this. I really like this approach. So if you start by your project, maybe you have uh, something that you want to build, then and then you adapt. Uh, based on your, your requirements, because otherwise, yeah, Angie just said database, but if we start learning all the databases, probably you are getting old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ellie, sorry. No, I agree with that. I love the idea of having a project and you're learning the things in order to actually build that thing and keep adding features to it. The other thing that I would say is that if you're self-teaching, a strategy would be to look at job postings in your area because this is actually going to be geographically really different even within the United States. Like if you're in the Midwest, for example, we're usually a couple years behind the coasts when it comes to technology. And so look up what skills people are asking for in your area and make a learning plan based off of that. So say, okay, I'm seeing Java in every single job description. I should probably add that to my list or think of a project for Java that I can have in my portfolio. Think about that. And then I think from there, it's turning on the blinders. Like you will see all these different things on Twitter. You'll see all these things on Dev2 and you'll want to learn them. But I think of this idea of shiny object syndrome where you see these new things and you want to learn them. But especially when you're starting out, depth is going to be better than breadth. So learn something in depth rather than learning all these different things because the deep knowledge will apply from tool to tool. Whereas that shallow knowledge, if you can write hello world in 15 languages, that's not going to really get you a developer job. And so instead focus on going deep and then you can transfer those deep skills from language to language as you grow. That would be my two cents. And Ali, that's so good. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm just going to say, um, no, that's so good, especially being able to transfer, right? So just go deep on what, pick one. That's why we're like, just pick one. It doesn't even matter, right? Pick one. And if you learn that well enough, it, is, it doesn't have to be programming language, databases, uh, programming language, all of this stuff is transferable, right? So I'm at the point now, I'm not afraid to learn like another language because I know Java so deeply that um, when I pick up another one, it's about like syntax changes and maybe there's a little bit um, that's different behind that, but I already know the core concepts of programming so well that I'm not as intimidated. Yeah, I totally agree. For example, if you know how to say hello in 15 different languages, probably it will be hard to become an interpreter. <laughs> Maybe you can write them in your curriculum, but uh, that's not enough because <laughs> since people understand that, uh, yeah, I like this idea that uh, understand the, the fundamentals of a programming language first, and then maybe it will become easier to switch maybe. And of course, adapting of, if you need to learn another language based on a project or if you just want to, if you, when you're ready to start something new. Yeah. That's I find cool. it also helpful 
in addition to just picking one thing, like make sure you're picking something that you need. Like when you're trying to build something into a project, maybe you don't need a database since we're on the database example. Maybe you can just live with a static JSON file in your project until you get to the point where you need that database. So don't try to over engineer something, which is going to just bring on more stress and anxiety. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Colby. Now I found, I need to choose some questions because there are so many, so we need to move fast. Well, uh, almost one hour already. Um, so Martin say, asks, uh, how to stay consistent and find balance with other things in life? So we have only 24 hours in a day, so we need to find the balance. Um, yeah, this topic really, I really like this topic. So I can start. For me, for example, it, it it works uh, to wake up early. Of course, you can be very successful even if you wake up at, uh, I don't know, 1 p.m. But uh, for me, because I'm really productive uh, in the very early early hours, I can take a walk. Uh, like if I can, if I watch the, the, the clock and it's uh, 10 a.m. and I've already done a lot of things, uh, it gives me a really good uh, sensation. So that's my, let's say, little secret. What about uh, you? I could jump in. Uh, this is something I think about a lot. Uh, I have kids now, so thankfully I didn't have kids when I started Free Code Camp because Free Code Camp probably wouldn't exist if, if I had kids running around distracting me all day. Um, my humble advice would be just keep be mindful of diminishing returns. That's probably the single piece of advice. Like if you've spent like an hour coding, you know, you, you might be like way up here, but at some point you're going to start to go down in productivity. And that's a good opportunity to, to switch to task, like, like switch to email or, um, yeah, I mean, you want to get into a flow state, don't drop your flow state, <laughs> but if you're in a flow state and you can code for like four hours and straight, go for it. Same thing with like writing or, or whatever it is you're doing that requires a lot of deep focus. But, um, for me, like with learning, um, I, spend a good chunk of my day learning that I'm not, you know, doing childcare and, and working. Uh, I'm, I'm like learning, uh, you know, I'm trying to maintain my manner in Chinese from when I lived in China for six years. I'm trying to uh, get better at Spanish. Uh, and then I'm also, you know, learning some musical instruments and stuff like that, just to, just to keep my brain going and, and it's fun. Uh, and what I try to do is just like 30 minutes a day on one thing. If I can achieve that, good. Um, and, and, you know, Sean Wang, uh, has this like no zero days thing that he talks a lot about. And like, if you made even, if you even did one push up, <laughs> you know, that's, that's progress, right? It's not a zero day. So, uh, just, just not letting yourself kind of fall into, a, you know, a lull where like you, you haven't studied Spanish for three days in a row and you're just like, what the hell? There's, there's something called the, what the hell effect where people, uh, basically give up on things or they say, well, I've already you know, I've already skipped three days, I can skip one more, you know. Uh, but the right attitude, I think, is the no zero day and, and trying to figure out a way that you can just do everything you need to do, even if it's just a little bit of what you need to do every day to keep things moving in the direction you want them to move. Yeah, I think that's a great the idea of no zero days and building up habits as well. So having some sort of habit tracker where you check it off. I always recommend the books, Tiny Habits and Atomic Habits. They talk a ton about building habits and how to make them achievable. And I also like the idea of making it as small as possible. One push up, for example, or read one page, making sure that you're just building up these habits because they'll help you. But I would also say that these things aren't in opposition to one another. I think that having some sort of work-life harmony actually helps you be a better worker as well. And Doing things like taking care of your health will give you more energy and make it so that you can be more present during the day. Or if you are making sure to work on outside hobbies, that will make it so that you're uh, more apt to learn other things on, during the workday. And so don't see these things as opposition to one another. Uh, if it makes anybody feel better, like I don't have work Slack or email or anything like that on my phone. I work my work hours and that's it. And I try to keep a good life between uh, those two pieces of my life. So yeah, that's my two cents, I guess. No slack on your phone. You're a better person than I am. Yeah. If you have the luxury of being able to turn off notifications on your phone. Yeah. 
I, I'm in the zero notification gang. You know, <laughs> just uh, basically, uh, if, if it's an absolute emergency, someone will call me. Otherwise, <laughs> I just uh, set my phone down and yeah. let my kids. Yeah, I, I think at, uh, at some point you need to turn uh, off notifications, at least for Twitter. Otherwise, you stop believing, basically. <laughs> so that's a must, uh, I think. Uh, yeah, Colby, wasn't you saying something? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's also important that if you're sharing some of that other time with another person or kids in your life to make sure that you're communicating with them about the goals that you have. Like if if you have a job that's outside of tech, for instance, and you want to spend a little bit of time each day trying to learn, uh, learn to code, maybe, maybe make sure you communicate with those other people and make sure that they know those expectations so that they can help you and you all can work together to find what time works best for the family or for whatever. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. My, my answer to this is like very different. Um, for, for me, I find that if I put something like on a schedule, it's it, it doesn't make me feel good. <laughs> um, it's like pressure and it kind of takes the fun out of it for me. For example, like um, writing, you know, I know some people, they write like every day or every week I must put out content or something like that. I don't like to live like that. Um, I like to kind of leave it open. Like, yeah, I know I need to write content. I want to do it when I'm in the mood to do it. Um, you know, and then it becomes like, it kind of becomes habitual, but I, I've psyched myself out a little bit to it's like, well, this is not a chore. This is something I'm choosing to do. And it's like, it, I don't know, it's a little bit more delight there for me um, versus, okay, every X I have to do Y. Um, and that's just me. I found that works better for me. I think that's also a good point. I saw earlier someone was asking about avoiding burnout. I think that's also a good way to help avoid burnout because if you're just forcing yourself to do something and you're losing your joy out of it and it's just becoming a repetitive thing, like you're going to burn out because you're not enjoying it. But if you can keep that motivation and do things because you want to do them, it's going to help you stay focused and motivated. Yeah, I really like this topic. For example, using always an analogy with sport. I always like to say that uh, instead of just forcing yourself to get content or to write that article at any cost, uh, it's better maybe to put yourself in the best condition to do that. So maybe that, that's more important, maybe. Maybe if you write uh, one less article, but if you feel better, even physically, I'm saying, this can really help you maybe in the long way. So don't force yourself. This is my idea, of course. Uh, we, I, I motivate and push every day on Twitter. So if you read that, if you need that, uh, it could be also useful. But uh, yeah, at the end of the day, for me, it's better, better uh, yeah, to, um, to do that. So, wow, it's already one hour. Let's see if we have some other questions. I think, uh, yeah, and then we can, we can stop for, for this episode. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. We got a lot of questions. Let's see if I still have some of them. So let's let's start to maybe the the final questions that they had prepared. It was like uh, about uh, uh, learning online and learning offline. Do you think that people will stop learning from books and in physical schools in the future at all, or both ecosystems uh, will we stay when we will maybe stay together? I think I would like to start to answer this one. I think books are probably here to stay because it's just the most precise, efficient way that a single person can put together a whole lot of information. I mean, it's the cost of creating a book is I sit down on my computer and I type. It's really just time. There's no real uh, barriers to entry. I mean, publishing and stuff, books don't take much data. They can be stored. They're, they're going to, the written word is going to continue to exist. I think in many respects, Courses are an evolution of books in the sense that you can have like a video component, you can have interactive components, and it can still follow kind of the similar structure of a book where there are like chapters and everything. But I, I mean, I personally don't read a lot of books anymore uh, unless I'm reading like older books, like history books and stuff like that, that predated kind of contemporary courses. Uh, like you won't see me at the airport buying like books from the bookshop to read on the plane. Usually I've got like courses downloaded or something that I'm gonna watch instead. Uh, but 
uh, yeah, I think that schools are going to definitely continue to exist. We've seen during this pandemic that a lot of people really benefit from learning at school and it's hard to reproduce a lot of the uh, kind of uh, feel and the motivation uh, when you're doing fully online learning. So yeah, I think online learning is a nice complement to some sort of in-person learning, especially for young children. Uh, for more for adults that are have more extrinsic motivation, uh, like they've got to get a good job, they've got to be able to perform on the job and things like that, they're going to be more motivated to just seek out resources and learn individually online. But uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't count schools out for sure. Yeah, okay. I'd like to hear the Ali idea because maybe she does this in real life and also a lot of also online. So what do you think about this? We will still have schools in the future. Yeah, I think my thought is that something that has gotten lost a little bit in the conversation this year with COVID is that humans are fundamentally social creatures and not all of that can be fully replicated online. And so I think that in-person classrooms are very helpful for that reason alone. And I think that it allows the learning to be a little bit more hands-on. Like you can show somebody your screen directly without having to go through screen share or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I personally think that in-person learning is here to stay, at least in a hybrid format. Yeah, okay. Angie, would you like to say something? Yeah, um, I hope that I hope that um, the traditional paths don't go away. I actually prefer that um, for myself. I really like being in a classroom, and um, like Ali said earlier, you know, being able to ask uh, the instructor something that I don't quite understand. You know, like right there in real time, they say something. It's like. That doesn't make sense. Do you mean this? You know, um, I really, really, really love that. Um, I, I love the whole like classroom environment with other students and stuff like that. So I really hope that, that doesn't um, go away. I don't foresee it. Um, I think having like various um, options for people to learn is really ideal. So hopefully we can keep everything. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Colby, do you have some final thoughts about this? Yeah, and it's, it's quick. Uh, I think it's, I don't think anything's going to go away, but I think it's going to evolve as technology evolves. It's going to bring those two experiences closer together, where I think we're going to have very beneficial and more accessible experiences for uh, people to learn. So, thank you, Colby. So, Usually these episodes, they last one hour and so we have already passed that. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming here, answer to a lot of questions. We had a lot of people. Thank you everyone, really. Uh, Angie, would you like to say maybe a final message? So I mean, then you are free to leave or yeah. Yeah, so, yeah sure. sure. Um, so thank you for having me first off. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, yeah, I encourage you to, you know, Continue your learning in this in this space is basically required. Um, things just change so rapidly, and leaning on like the the foundational skills that you learned in the beginning is helpful. But you cannot stay there, or you'll become outdated. So, whatever format you take on, whether that be online, whether that be um, physical learning, whatever that may be, um, do what's best for you. But definitely continue learning. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Angie. Someone else. Uh, so would you like to say something? Maybe just a final message to someone who's listening. Maybe it's a bit, it's, it's feeling a little bit lost. Uh, yeah. About this uh, overwhelming. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can go for it. So first off, I think acknowledging that you can't learn everything is a huge piece of the problem. I There are unlimited numbers of programming languages, some more in use than others. There's unlimited numbers of frameworks. You're never going to know all of them. That's just 
the pure fact that it's not possible. There aren't enough hours in a lifetime to learn all of that. And so embracing that early on so that you don't feel like you're missing out by not knowing X or Y. Specialize, teach, shape your knowledge. And what that means is having some piece of depth, but also having some shallow knowledge and some other topics. These things are going to get you ahead in your career. And you got this. I like that. Uh, yeah, I really like, like that. Colby, would you like to say something? Yeah, um, I literally was going to say the same thing that Ali said. You got this. You can't. Uh, you can't. You need to say something different. <laughs> okay, you can do it. Uh, no, but, um, you know, keep, try to find some motivation and, uh, you know, keep high spirits. Don't, you know, don't try to get too down on yourself. There's, there's so much to learn and, um, you know, great community behind you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Quincy. Yeah. I don't really have anything to add uh, to what uh, Ali, Colby, and Angie have said here, uh, but I would like to point out that if you scroll down, that uh, you can follow all three of them on Twitter. I follow all three of them. They're like super insightful. It's nice to like just pop in and see like interesting th problems they're working on and uh, a lot of inspiring stuff as well and hear about their upcoming courses. Um, and also, this channel you're watching, Francesco's channel, you know, he, he's like a very uh, experienced engineer, uh, worked, you know, in European uh, science uh, community. He has, I don't know, dozens of hours worth of interviews with people like Colby uh, here on the channel. And uh, I totally recommend you hit the subscribe button and, and go through his backlog. Uh, he's got a back catalog of tons of great in interviews. Uh, and I just want to thank you, Francesco, for putting this together and, and for inviting me. Yeah, it's been a blast. Yeah, just let me finish. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of you. Also, uh, Quincy, also Quincy, thank you for giving me this idea of this special edition. I, I've never done an interview with more than one person. This is my very first time. And I got this from, from one to four with great and amazing developers. But I'm really happy about uh, this idea. So I met this in practice. A lot of people are thanking you, of course. Uh, Eddie, Jude, uh, Foreign Pop, uh, you are late. Uh, and also, yeah, I got also some subscription. Thank you. Thank you, Quincy. <laughs> and that's it. So thank you, every, everyone. And uh, yeah, so we are Thanks, done. Everybody. Yeah, and of course, uh, I've left in the description the links uh, to all of them. Please uh, do yourself a favor and follow them all uh, or whatever, because you'll never regret that, of course. We are done. Bye-bye. See ya. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.